I know you know a lot about that um, more than me, in fact. But it, what what I liked when you said, David, you should look up this plant based diet and the benefits. Um, there are a lot of studies that show that certain types of foods and diets are uh, really have a big impact on cancer, can reduce your chance of cancer by many fold. Uh, and that's not the only reason you would potentially live longer on these diets, but it's certainly an important one. Hi. Hi, Serena. How are you today? Great. How are you doing? Good. So, well, uh, Ismo is off to the side. He was having a tough day. So, uh... Last time he slept through the whole thing, so hopefully today. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so hopefully today he's, he's going to be doing okay. Uh, so, we have obviously so many questions. Um, thank you. I'm so excited that we're doing this again. And um, obviously, I've already shared with people that we're not going to get to all the questions. Um, and some of them are shared here on social, but you know, just encouraging everyone to go to link in our bios and to sign up with uh, to that landing page that gives them sort of a little bit more access to the content that we're sharing here and replays and resources. And also, if you text questions to the number uh, that we've shared, then, then that just stays on the text log that you send in so they don't disappear like they do on social. So um, just to just so that we can be as you know be of service as much as possible to everyone. So um, okay, so yay! So today we're going to talk about longevity diets. Um, so many questions. Obviously, there's a few key questions that that we want to go over. Um, I'm just going to summarize the questions for the people who are on here taking notes so that you can kind of manage your time. We're going to cover longevity diets, what's real and what's a fad. Um, okay, we're going to try to cover these five questions and we're going to do our best. So if we don't, then we'll get back to it. But we're going to try to cover that. And uh, what is xenohermesis, which I'm really excited. Maybe we can actually start off talking about that. Uh, and then whether or not a plant-based diet is the best for longevity. We say 80% of our questions have a lot to do with that alone and whether or not people need to stop eating meat and, you know, collagen and uh, and even fish and other products. Uh, we're gonna go through some longevity foods, uh, whether or not they are actually longevity foods or not. And um, and then we're, we'll talk about some supplements. So this is our goal for this chat, but we only have about you know, 45, 50 minutes. So if we don't get to all of them, as I've already shared before Dr. St. Clair came on, uh, when, we have questions, when you have questions that we don't answer, I encourage you to send them in, send them into the text message, sign up in the link in bio, um, subscribe because we can always uh, take all those questions that weren't answered and we can, we can do them in a different episode. So even if it's not in this one, we can always address it later on. So it's always helpful to send them in um, and don't feel like you missed out if we don't answer all of them today. Yeah, and we're also, if you subscribe to this um, series, we have notes that we put out and we can send you by email. So subscribe. Yeah, so there's that. And then the replay is too, so it makes it much easier for you guys to find. Um, there will be a link to the replay in uh, in that link in the bio for the link yeah, that shows this landing page. Uh, so, okay, so there's so many comments. It's actually hard for me to see them all myself. Right. People keep um, asking about my hair, Serena. But they should be asking about your hair. <laughs> um, well, my hair is real. For those of you who are often curious about whether or not it is, it is. And I would say that it comes from um, all the nutrients I get from my plant-based diet. Uh, but we can talk about that more later. Uh, and oh, your hair. Do hair. I get Botox? No, I don't get Botox. But I do get Dysport. Uh, a few times a year, and I'm well overdue for one. So I'm sure you guys see wrinkles that aren't normally there. But uh, yeah, and I'm super open. If people want to ask me questions, I'm happy to answer them. There's nothing to hide. Uh, okay, so should we dive in? Um, I really would love for you to talk about xenohermesis because I talk so often about eating the rainbow uh, and how that's so important in terms of all the nutrients, vitamins, and minerals we get from the spectrum of the rainbow of plants, 
But you dive into something very important, which is why those plants have those deep colors and what that actually means um, that they have those deep colors. So could we dive into that for a minute? Because that's such a new term that people have only heard through you um, and through your last podcast. Okay. Uh, So the idea is that we've evolved with plants and plants don't just give us food. They give us warning about the future. And when plants are worried about their own survival, let's say they don't have enough water or they get too much sun or in the case of green tea and matcha, they don't get enough sun. Mm -hmm. Uh, They put out these molecules. They make these molecules so they can survive. And these are molecules that most of us are familiar with. There's there's quercetin, phazetin, resveratrol from red wine, uh, oleic acid from olive oil, there's curcumin. All of these molecules are made, many of them are called polyphenols. These are chemicals with little circles of carbon. That's called a phenol. And, uh, and they're linked together. And over the years, over the centuries, we've learned that these molecules from plants are very healthy for us. And what I've been uh, saying in my uh, research and in my, my book is that perhaps it's not their antioxidant activity that's so important. In fact, many of them are really terrible antioxidants. Resveratrol isn't great. Uh, it's Vitamin C is way better. But it's resveratrol that protects you against a Western diet uh, and lowers blood sugar. So what is going on? And so Conrad Howitz, uh, another doctor and I, uh, about 10 years ago came up with this concept called xenohormesis, X-E-N-O, which means between species. And hormesis is the term of adversity. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you actually stronger and longer lived, we think. So xenohormesis, uh, the idea is you want to eat plants that make these molecules. Red wine is a good example, but also matcha tea, uh, and Serena, you can rattle off a lot of them. But we tend to look, she and I look, Serena and I look for plants that are colorful because colors come along with these polyphenols. And we look for foods that are, are not uh, handled with kid gloves. So if you go looking for food and it's, let's say you find a lettuce that's watery and pale and not very green, that's the opposite. Those plants won't have a lot of these polyphenols, whereas the bright green and red and orange ones and the drinks that are full of color, like red wine in moderation, uh, have these polyphenols. So why do they make us healthier, we think? The idea is that they give us a heads up as to uh, what the future looks like. And if the food is stressed out, our food supply is, is running out, we need to get ready and hunker down or actually defend ourselves against inflammation, against DNA damage, against radiation coming in. And so we, we when we eat these polyphenols, we've seen, and certainly in test animals in the lab, remarkable health benefits that translate, in the case of animals, into longevity and protection from a bad diet, as well as mimicking exercise. And so we call these molecules xenohermitins. And we think that this theory explains why antioxidants haven't been as successful in the longevity field as we once thought. Um, And actually what they're doing is turning on our body's natural defenses against disease and aging. So I hope that was, um, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get caught up in some of these comments here. Uh, that was really helpful. So I hope that helps people understand um, why we say that, why that is. And I, I thought that was a really thorough explanation. So thank you for that. Um, should we dive into some, some of the topics that you talked about? Uh, longevity, fasting, because there's so many questions about that. And I think I shared with Sue some of the questions that came in. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. so that there are a variety of diets. And uh, of course, your diet, um, your recommendations, I'm now uh, attempting to practice myself. So I've really paid attention to what you've taught me. Um, and it's all science based, which is great. That's what I pay attention to. And so my diet has, has now tended very largely towards a plant based diet, uh, and much less dairy. Uh, and I, I would call myself a struggling vegan, uh, but I'm getting there. But the, but the idea, it really is that um, it's not just what you eat, but when you eat that I think is important. And we're all different. So some some of us like food in the evening, some of us like food in the morning, some of us are female with menstrual cycles. So there's a lot to take in. But in general, what we're talking about is not making the body always in a state of being fed. They need, I think there needs to be at least during the week, sometimes when the body uh, is lacking food, lacking blood has low blood sugar. Um, And so there's various types of diets, we call them. We used to call it calorie restriction. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It was first found 100 years ago that restricting calories in rats makes them live about 30% longer because they're healthier. They don't get cancer and diabetes. Then there's uh, more recently we call them um, intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding or protein restriction or the keto diet. These are all variations on a theme, restricting elements about what what is a terrible Western diet that we're being fed by large uh, companies. The one that I practice uh, myself is one meal a day. I try at least to put most of my calories into one large meal, which is, for me is dinner. I really love dinner uh, and that's mostly plants. Uh, but you might like breakfast and, and you want to skip dinner or you might want to have lunch. It's all up to you. And, and the main thing to know is that when, when you, you don't have a lot of food through the day, let's say you skip breakfast, you're actually turning on your body's defenses against aging, the same ones that these xenohermetans turn on. So I've been skipping breakfast uh, for most of my life. And during the pandemic, I started having a very small lunch uh, and now I skip lunch. If I'm hungry during the day, I'll nibble on a, a few nuts or, or have maybe a spoonful of yogurt. But other than that, I try to power on through chocolate. Serena, you and I talk a lot about chocolate, very high cacao density um, or percentage, 80% plus is, is a good snack as well, um, healthy. But ultimately, uh, I really enjoy dinner. I really enjoy eating a plant-based dinner. Um, and my blood work, which I measure fairly routinely, has only improved since I've been on those diets. And there's a lot of science um, I could cite. And maybe in the notes, Serena, that we put out, we'll put some studies yeah. to back this up. But there's so many studies showing that a plant-based diet, mostly plant-based diets, improves health. I mean, I've got one. I'll just tell you, if you're on a Mediterranean diet, which is mostly plants, a little bit of fish, olive oil as the fat, uh, you actually reduce your mortality rate by 31%. And that there are others, there's, there's one compared to non-vegetarians, you can reduce your chances of death in life by all causes uh, by more than 12%. And so ultimately I would say that the, the one that's the most health, the healthiest is vegan uh, and pescatarian. Uh, and then from there on, opto, lacto, vegetarians. And then the ones that don't seem to associate with the longest life are the regular Western diet, which we all know is horrible, full of sugar and, and terrible fats. Um, and also the carnivore diet. I wish carnivore diets were the longest because I love meat, but really the science doesn't back that up, unfortunately. And right. the reason we think this all works is not it's not just the nutrients that we get and the xenohermetans, it's also keeping your blood sugar levels relatively low, uh, amino acid levels not too high, uh, and also uh, puts your body in that state of one and turns on your body's defenses. And all up, that's what gives you this 31% reduction in mortality. Uh, so, no, and thank you for that. Um, again, so helpful and just to have so many uh, scientific references and studies and uh, links that we will share after the notes here. There are a lot of comments that have come in and uh, just some just some thoughts uh, that I wanted to share when it comes to eating, uh, when it comes to fasting and having a smaller, what I like to call eating window. So whether or not you're fasting for 12 hours or 16 hours or 18 hours. Um, I don't typically recommend people go more than 18 hours. But again, it's all as you know, what David was sharing was that this is what works for him. So it's really important, I think, to, to really get a sense of what works for your body and whether or not you're someone that likes to eat in the evening or someone that likes to eat in the morning also sort of depends on your chronotype, um, like your sleep chronotype, which we've had, you know, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Michael Bruce, who's a sleep doctor, who has a very simple test that you can take that's free. Um, those links are in our replays. You can also go to his website to kind of figure out what it, what your body type is. You know, are you someone that is sort of a night person or if you're a morning person, that can also factor into uh, what your fasting window is. Um, and so then when your eating window is, so maybe you're someone that uh, functions best eating from six to 10, some people might function better eating from, you know, eight to midnight, it kind of depends. And, and I love that, uh, and, and 
And I love that Dr. St. Clair also mentioned uh, women's menstrual cycles that did pop up in the comments here. So yes, when you're fasting, it is different for women and men. And um, depending on where, you, where you're at in your cycle, you kind of have to modify your eating window and your fasting and your fasting window. Uh, and that's something, you know, that we can share here. You can look it up. But again, it kind of depends on what your goals are, where you're at in terms of your age, if you're uh, if you're uh, menopausal or perimenopausal, if you're trying to get pregnant, if you have any type of thyroid issues, um, that all factors into uh, the amount of nutrients that you're getting in, the level of stress that you're putting on your body. I think what Dr. Sinclair has really emphasized is that stress is good for our bodies, but sometimes we can but overstressing our bodies is also not good, right, David? I, I yeah, think yeah, you can that. you can over, definitely overdo it with exercise and over fasting. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, is it is it a problem going over twelve hours? So I, I, I disagree with Walter Longo on that. I think that it's okay to go for eighteen hours. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the longer you go, the more autophagy you have. You recycle old proteins, and it's been shown that there's a deep cleansing that actually happens after three days. Now, I don't go for three days. I go for 18, 20 hours. Um, but I think somewhere bet between 12 hours and, and 18, 20 is a nice spot for most people, depending on how they, they feel and how what they can do. And the thing that's important to know is that I measure myself. I take, I do, I do blood tests every few months uh, through Inside Track or a company that I consult for. And I've been tracking myself for over a decade. And so I know what works for me. My blood biochemistry is extremely youthful and healthy. Uh, a little gizmo. Um, yeah. So we've got, um, you, know, you, you need to know what's happening to your body. And, and for some people, 12 hours might be great. But for me, I found that the 18, 20, uh, what I like to do and what's working well for me. Yeah. So so that's just a really important, I think, point to kind of circle back and remind people that it, it kind of depends on your body. And also what's very important is the nutrients that you get in during your eating window. You know, it's really important to hit um, a certain level of nutrients when you're eating and making sure that you're eating high quality foods, um, nutrient dense foods that give your body the fuel that it needs during that eating window. Uh, and so obviously that's something, some of the things that we're going to talk about here as well. Karina, there's, there's one thing I want to mention, because I'm seeing people worried about giving up food. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing, you can eat really well what we're saying, what, well, I could guess what I'm saying is um, don't always feed yourself. You don't need three big meals a day with snacks in between. Right. Try to eat two meals a day if that's how you feel and substitute liquids with a meal. So I have, I have water, I have tea, I have athletic greens, which has a lot of nutrients in it. I have just, just add water. water. <laughs> that was coming. I, mm -hmm. I do have just add water on, uh, on every other day. And so I'm, I'm making sure that my, my body has the nutrients, but I'm also filling up uh, on liquids which don't have the calories. Um, and so what I've noticed by measuring my blood glucose level with a patch here, that my, my liver kicks in after about two weeks. If I'm, if you try this, you should give it at least two weeks because it takes a while to get used to. And after that two weeks, your liver will start putting out sugar and you won't feel hungry as much. Uh, I don't feel hungry during the day. Uh, very rarely, actually, only when I'm stressed do I need to eat something and it's, it's not because I'm hungry. Uh, and so you'll find that it is tough in the beginning. So I recommend, we recommend having lots of liquids in, to substitute. But my, my diet, I, I love my life. I love eating the kinds of foods that I can eat dinner. And I can have a really big dinner. Before, I'd always have to watch what I ate. But now I, I just eat what I want and I don't feel hungry during the day. Well, that is also it's the substitution of caloric intake from meat and dairy. And now there's plants. So it's I think that's also probably why. Um, so, so I agree with, I agree with David, it's, uh, uh, you know, try just going 12 hours. If you're not already fasting, you know, don't forget that your sleep time counts towards your fasting time. So from when you stop eating dinner to when you put something into your body the next day, try 12 hours and then move it up to 14 and then 16. And then if you get to 18 or 20, that's usually the best way to go. So it's not I know we want to shock our bodies, but it's not such a shock that it's not sustainable. Um, and doing it that way is really helpful. And I agree with hydration. You know, I often say, you know, you want to shoot for one ounce per pound that you weigh, bearing that you have no kidney issues and you're not deficient in certain minerals. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a really great goal. And if you 
pair that goal with uh, a fasting period of, you know, let's say at least 16 hours, um, it makes it easier because you're staying hydrated throughout the day. And so often we think we're hungry, but we're really dehydrated. And um, just wanting to address some of the questions that came up last time and that came, popped up uh, for um, in the questions that came in about the quality of water. It doesn't necessarily have to be bottled water, but it should be clean, clean filtered water, which you can often get if it's in a if it's bottled. Um, but mineral rich water is also wonderful, like you know something like Mountain Spring. I think that's one of the one Mountain Valley, but you know mineral rich natural waters is also great. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be bottled, but uh, something that's filtered and, you know, not just through the tap, I think is what we were trying to share at the last time and since then. So just to address some of the water questions since we're talking water. Um, yeah. There was a question yeah. about um, these drinks. Do they break my fast? I mean, I think for the aficionados, they'd say, yeah, maybe. Uh, I measure my, my, my blood glucose uh, and it doesn't change when I have these drinks. I don't have a lot of it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's mainly just to, not have boring water all the time it's a little bit of flavor uh and yours is chocolate which i love too so really you know i'm not so strict people think that i'm some kind of uh you know some sort of a guy that uh, only sticks to rules i eat stuff that i shouldn't occasionally um and so i think that the, the point here is you do your best um you don't have to be so strict about it and um you do what works for you and what works for me is you know, being good 95% of the time. And if, mm -hmm. if there's a few things I need to have, which is a tiny bit of yogurt in the morning to mix with my polyphenols to dissolve them, or some just add water uh, a little bit, and I know that that's not spiking my blood sugar, um, it's great. You know, and again, I'm measuring my blood biochemistry. I look at my inflammation, my blood cells. I look at uh, inflammation of my cardiovascular system, my, my sex hormones, my glucose levels, of course. And uh, I know that what I'm doing is making me healthier. My doctor agrees. And so, you know, while we can argue over whether this or that is not according to the rules, I know it, what I'm doing is working for me. Mm -hmm. um, and again, such a good reminder that there's so many tests and um, ways that you can measure your biomarkers and you can see what's going on in your body and you can see how the different changes that you're making in your lifestyle can yield you you know positive benefits it's good to just know you know if you there are so many tests now um and we're not going to necessarily endorse any different brands but um other than of course since i track it which uh, uh dr st Clair is really familiar with there are so many online that you can they can send you a kit an at-home kit and mm -hmm. you can take these tests and then just have a baseline have a sense of where you're at and how these things are affecting your body and that's sometimes one of the best references um oh and serena we we yeah. have some uh discount links for people uh yeah on the website yeah, yeah. On the, if, yeah, so if you go to the link in both of our bios, it takes you to the landing page, which has some of our trusted uh, brands and resources that we both use. And so there's discount links there. So if you want to sign up for Inside Tracker, um, I think that there's a discount link there. And uh, David talked a lot about uh, glucose monitor. And so that's levels, which you were probably already familiar with because of his podcast, but there's links there too. And these are all just great tools um, that kind of help you integrate this information that you're getting now and make it work for you, which is what's most important. Okay, question that's right there is, I, I do it every three weeks, I'm oh, sorry, three months, and I do the ultimate test. And I do inner age, inner age, 2.0 tells me my uh, estimated biological age. And so it's been getting younger and younger over the last 10 years, um, which is you know quite rewarding and not optimizing my body for various things. So I'm 52, I'm down now to 42, which places me in the top 2% of all users. So there's that goal that you guys can all put into your, <laughs> you can shoot for the same goal. 10 years, 10 years younger, um, especially if you follow all these, all these guides. Um, but let's go back to, let's go back to a plant-based diet and whether or not that is the best diet for longevity. Uh, there were questions that I thought were really great questions that came in about whether or not plant proteins activate mTOR. Um, I know the, the answer to that, but I would love if you could answer that, uh, David, because for anyone who missed the last 
um, episode where we discuss mTOR um, and AMPK, that would be helpful to answer that here since we we're talking about plant-based diets and plant-based yeah. proteins. Right, so mTOR, little m, T-O-R, stands for target of rapamycin, which is a drug that uh, may extend lifespan in humans, but certainly does in animals. Uh, so mTOR is a protein that is in all of our cells that measures how many amino acids we're taking in. And it doesn't bother measuring, measuring all 20 amino acids. It particularly measures the amount of leucine in the diet, well, so, as well as a few others, uh, such as glutamine and serine. But um, leucine is the big one. Um, and it's a branch chain amino acid that comes in abundance from meat. And when you eat a huge amount of steak, for, for instance, mTOR will be activated and it will turn on the body's production of uh, making proteins and uh, putting on fat and it'll put your body in a an abundance mode because eating a steak puts your you know your body says this is great we've just killed a mammoth time to grow now that's not conducive we think to long-term longevity what we think is is to either inhibit mTOR with um, perhaps things like a collagen digest or uh, with this drug rapamycin or even better being uh, skipping a meal or eating a, a plant-based diet, which has relatively low amounts of leucine compared to meat, certainly weight for weight. Mm -hmm. um, and that in inhibition or downregulation of this mTOR protein in our cells will do a number of things. It'll improve insulin sensitivity, it'll lower inflammation. But the biggest thing that it does that's important for longevity is it recycles the bad, damaged and old proteins in our body. Uh, and that's called autophagy, and that's really important. And so you can do that by fasting, and can, you can do that by mTOR. But what's interesting, at least in mice, is if you combine downregulation of mTOR and restricting calories, there's an additive effect. They both seem to work together. And that's why I both skip meals and I tend towards plants. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answered those questions there. And um, that we uh there we did talk about collagen you and i a bit and there's uh, quite a few questions that have come up about that about collagen supplements um and just supplements actually before we dive into collagen can we address um, a really common question and it's whether or not taking your supplements breaks your fast um very very common question and um is it okay to take supplements on an empty on an empty stomach um well, good, two, two good questions. So uh, having experimented on myself for over a decade, I don't see that drinking a little bit of just add water or taking a, a couple of spoonfuls, maybe three teaspoons of coconut based yogurt in the morning with my polyphenols, resveratrol, quercetin, physique, and other three ones I mainly do. I don't see them as breaking a fast. Okay. And having watched myself and measured myself, it doesn't do any harm. Um, and it, it's actually necessary for me to get through the day and you do what's necessary. Okay. And, um, and so while I may have a little bit of protein in my body from the yogurt and from, uh, just add water, it goes away pretty quickly and my blood sugar doesn't go up, which is my main goal. Mm -hmm. The blood sugar levels are the key really. Yeah. Um, you don't want those spikes in the morning and then you get hungry at lunchtime and then you eat again. That'll make you energetic and then a brain fog and be tired and then you're hungry again. That cycle is, I've done that most of my life and it's a nightmare. Now that I have my lifestyle and the type of foods I eat, I power through the day and my glucose levels are steady because my liver is much smarter at putting out glucose than my eyes and my mouth are. And, yeah. uh, and let your liver take care of you during the day and then feed yourself later in the day. That's my advice. Yeah, and there's, you know, and I think if you can wait until you are, um you are having a bit of food yeah. in your diet and um, you're not taking supplements that have to be taken earlier in the day, then maybe wait and take it then so you're not on an empty stomach. Uh, and it, it also sounds like you sometimes you have to sort of experiment as well. I don't have a problem taking supplements on an empty stomach. I take my supplements with my matcha, you know, in the morning and, and my tummy's fine. I have no problems with it, but that's my body. So everyone's body's a little bit yeah, different. I I don't like taking supplements on an empty stomach usually because mm -hmm. especially at night, they sit mm -hmm. in my stomach and make me feel a bit sick and I don't sleep that well. Right. Um, so I like to have them. I have some in the morning and then mm -hmm. before bed I have some, but I try not to eat them, take them too late. And that's worked much better for me. Um, yes. oh, somebody, somebody said something important, which is 
Uh, breaking a fast is different to breaking ketosis. Ketosis is when yes. your body has switched from using carbohydrates uh, to protein and fat for energy, mainly fat. Mm -hmm. And um, my body doesn't change that. I'm still in ketosis, even if I eat a tiny bit of food or a little bit of the nutritious drink. Yeah, yeah, and and I that's such a it's something really good to point out as we were talking about as we were talking earlier when it comes to fasting. Um, I know that ketosis is a goal. Uh, but again, for women, you want to be mindful because if you're in uh, ketosis and extreme ketosis for too long a period of time, then you'll produce more reverse T3, which can affect your thyroid, it affects your hormones. And so um, for the women out there, just, just be a little bit more mindful about it and check your body um, and check your levels if you are kind of implementing fasting into your lifestyle and how long you fast and when you fast during the time of the month. Uh, and and um, and also know that during different weeks of the month, you do want to incorporate certain, say like um, uh, starches, resistant starches, certain carbohydrate carbohydrates that are good for you when you are fasting during your eating window. So just something to to kind of take note of. Uh, okay, so so we're talking so we're talking about that. Um, there are there a few things that you really you like to add as we're talking about fasting because there's so much that you covered in your podcast. Oh, and by the way, let me just interrupt myself really quick. For those of you guys that don't already know, uh, David has a podcast. Dr. St. Clair has a podcast called Lifespan. It drops a new episode drops every single Wednesday, and um, we are kind of doing a follow up to those uh, to those episodes when we have our lives and plus we pepper in a few other things. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do. Um, it's on Spotify, Apple, go to his uh, link in his bio. Um, and I would also encourage you guys to put on, turn on your alerts or your notifications because David lets you know when the podcast is dropping. And you can yeah. Go. It's on YouTube too. If you care to see me move my hands a lot. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's it, thank you to everybody who's subscribed that by subscribing, that's the best thing you can do for us. Uh, but yeah, it's wonderfully uh, warm welcome to this uh, from everybody for this podcast. I had no idea how it would be received, but it's been really an overwhelming uh, welcome from everybody. And I thank everybody who's taken the time to watch it or listen to it. So, um, so yeah, I just, every once in a while, I just remind myself to let, because people are coming in and out, and I'm assuming most everyone already knows um, who David Sinclair is and what his podcast is, but just in case you don't, make sure you subscribe, and in case you haven't subscribed and just go there every week, you should really should subscribe um, yeah, well, and turn on your post notifications. So, my, my buddy is Andrew Huberman from Stanford University, and we, we like to argue over who has the best university. Of course, we know that the answer to that. Uh, but I was also uh, keen to see if I could beat him on the podcast. And so right <laughs> now, we're, we're vying for place number one and two in wellness. Um, and so it's it's been a lot of fun. He's a good friend. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up to all this. So, so, so for the 2,000 plus viewers out there, just so you know, you can also help David beat Andrew Huberman by subscribing <laughs> to his podcast. <laughs> you might as well throw in some ratings and reviews too. I'm sure that'll Please. be really helpful. <laughs> yeah. Only if they're good ones though. No. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So now back to back to our questions that we might actually get through. We might actually get through most of them. Uh, I don't know if we're going to cover all the longevity foods because there's so many, but we can talk about some of the ones that are uh, that you guys have the biggest questions about. I mean, obviously we covered some stuff with antioxidant type foods, anti-inflammatory foods. Um, we talked about red wine and green tea uh, and, you know, xenohomesis and why those type of foods are sort of longevity foods, you know, that they help so much. Uh, should we talk a little bit more about supplements? Uh, I can't see if we're linked to the supplements. Uh... I can I can talk about the supplements that I do. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, we should all talk about we should talk about. Um, I've seen a lot of questions about cancer and foods. Which ones are good to prevent cancer? Yes. Um, but but the supplements that I take, uh, they're listed on page three hundred and four of of the book Lifespan, um, and I've added a few more ones. So the the basic ones are resveratrol, quercetin, physetin, these polyphenols. I have that in the morning. I have NMN, which is an NAD booster. NAD is important for boosting our body's natural defenses against aging as well. We've studied all of these molecules in my lab, discovered them 15 years ago. Now they're popular. 
Um, and so, and then at night I take oleic acid, um, high content oleic acid uh, oils. So like a fish oil supplement. I take vitamin D, vitamin K2. K2 is a really important one, which keeps the calcium out of your arteries and puts it into your bones where it's needed. Uh, what else do I do? I still take a little baby aspirin every night and I take CoQ10 and alpha lipoic acid at night as well. Uh, the CoQ10 is to make sure that the statin that I'm on for my cholesterol doesn't deplete that too much. Other than that, some, I saw somebody ask, does, does my diet or our diets lead to um, lack of nutrients? And the answer is no. We're very careful about making sure that we have these supplement drinks, just add water helps. I take um, the type of vitamins that I might need, vitamins B12, B6, B3. I'm monitoring my vitamin levels. So Inside Tracker will tell you, tell me, my vitamin B levels. Um, and also, um, I listened to you, Serena, you told me that I should eat Brazil nuts as much as I don't like them. <laughs> I nibble on a Brazil nut once a day. Uh, I probably eat one a day and that's got selenium in it, which is one of those vital uh, metals that you need. Yeah, so, and I would say that my list is very similar. I, I take more uh, and we can, it's, uh, it's such a long list. Um, a lot of mine are adaptogenic and I think because we've had questions about adaptogens and some natural herbs, uh, we can actually dedicate a whole episode to that uh, in the future where we can cover things that came up like maca and lacuma and ashwagandha and um, all kinds of things, you know, ginkgo, macopa, ilotero, just different things that are part of my supplement um, protocol uh, that it, that's in addition to what uh, David had listed as his that I also do. And um, and we can talk a little bit more about some of those have to be taken at certain times of the day to kind of really maximize those benefits. But I can, you know, give you guys a list and we'll kind of go through everything and then, and then do a talk on that um, at a later time. Um, and then the other thing, uh, the other thing we were talking about with supplements is uh, collagen. So, you know, we kind of just touched on it briefly, but I think that some people would really love to hear whether or not collagen supplements are actually yeah. good for them or they're not, um, yeah. short-term and long-term benefits and, um, you mm -hmm. know, kind of setbacks from collagen, if you could dive into that. Right. So, so collagen is the most abundant protein in your body. Uh, it's, it's important for your muscle, hold it together and your skin. And as you get older, you make less collagen and you degrade it and, uh, leads to the, the look of, of aging, but it's an essential protein. And it's a really interesting one from a biochemical, uh, a biologist standpoint, it's made as a triple helix, not, not double helix like DNA, but it's triple and to stabilize it because it needs to be there for years. The cell does what's called hydroxyl prolylation, and it just puts little oxygen and hydrogens onto collagen and that stabilizes it and what this uh ends up doing is it acts as a little signal to cells when they see this hydroxylation it can actually do good things and so what has been discovered is that when you eat collagen um, it actually does seem to and some clinical trials seems to improve hair hair and skin and they promote the gross growth of muscle cells and differentiation turning them into muscle cells um, how does it do that? Well, I was skeptical. I, from what I know, if you eat collagen, which is a protein, it's unlikely to work because your body will digest it and you'll just have amino acids and amino acids are amino acids. I'm open to the idea that eating digested collagen in the form of gummies or drinks, there's a various, there are various ways to take it in, could actually do what the Chinese have been saying for centuries, which is uh, it promotes the growth of things that are made of collagen as well. Okay, great. So thank you for covering that. We had a lot of questions about that. Um, and a question that just came up, do the amino acids in collagen uh, activate <coughs> mTOR? Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, the, the ones that are that are important, they, they go by various names. There's one called hydroxyl proylglycine, the other one's proyl, hydroxyl proline. Uh, but basically it's just proline with another amino acid or two next to it with that oxygen hydrogen. But you don't need to know that. It's just, you know, interesting from a scientist's point of view that there are potentially the body says, oh, there's a wound, there's mm -hmm. collagen being released and digested. I need to grow that wound and heal it. And by eating collagen, you can actually get these dipeptides into your body. They can be found in the bloodstream. And that might be how they're promoting skin growth, hair growth, and even wound healing. 
Uh, and just, and for those of you who are plant-based, you know, I used to use collagen. I don't anymore because I kind of prefer to more, uh, to different roots and plants and herbs that can also promote skin, uh, say wound healing. Wound healing lacuma is one of them. Like I said, we'll dive into more of these other types of adaptogenic herbs just as options for the people who are plant-based. And, uh, and I also wanted to uh, say that when you are plant-based, as David said, that you do have to make sure that you hit all of your um, nutrients. And so I do supplement with different amino acids as in a supplement form, um, as opposed to getting them from like a collagen product uh, or some of these other types of supplements. So, so, so yeah, so I hope that answers a lot of the collagen Can questions. Out there. Talk about cancer a little bit. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I, think that's really I, I know you know a lot about that more than me, in fact. But what what I liked when you said, David, you should look up this plant-based diet and the benefits. Um, there are a lot of studies that show that certain types of foods and diets are uh, really have a big impact on cancer, can reduce your chance of cancer by many fold. Uh, and that's not the only reason you would potentially live longer on these diets, but it's certainly a, an important one, especially considering most women, well, no, it's about a third of women in their 40s already have some type of breast cancer. Um, it may not kill them, but if you look, it's there. And you want to suppress the growth of those cancers. And by eating the right foods and leaving some out, you can actually prevent those little tiny tumors from growing. Um, and there's lots of lots of that. I mean, the, the kind of things that, that you know, I've been reading about are sulfur-rich foods, glutathione, um, leaving out animal proteins, which stimulate the production of a molecule called IGF, IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor one. In, insulin-like growth factor one is really important. I'll just pause on that. That, if you have low levels as a mouse or a human, makes you live longer. It's known to stimulate cancer. And if you eat a lot of meat, you have a lot of that. Um, and what's interesting is if you're on a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet and you take the blood of those people, of, of, of us, and you put it on cancer cells, it can inhibit them dramatically by 4,000% in terms of their growth. And that's largely thought to be do the very low levels of IGF-1 in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Again, a molecular explanation for why these diets have been shown over centuries to be healthy. Yeah, and um, and just to kind of add on to that, we spoke about it last time just briefly. We talked about um, uh, sulforaphane, which is very high in broccoli, but specifically broccoli sprouts and the seeds of the sprouts. These are things that you can add into your diet since we're talking about not just longevity foods, but something that's helpful for cancer. Um, they're found in... Uh, cruciferous type of vegetables, but if you say have a hard time digesting those type of foods, whether they're raw or steamed or cooked, um, you can also take it supplementally. You know, you can take, you know, a raw dehydrated version of broccoli sprouts or just the seeds and you can take them as supplements and that'll be really helpful as well. Um, since we did cover supplements a bit here today. Um, love your fresh broccoli sprouts, yay. And actually I did a, I did a couple Instagram lives with the king of sprouts, uh, Doug Evans. And so if you can always go back and check out those episodes and he kind of teaches you how simple it is to sprout your own seeds, whether they're broccoli or other things. Um, and that all has, they're very nutritional, nutritionally dense, but they also have what we sort of call anti-cancer properties as well. So, so yeah, um, well, we're kind of coming up to top of the hour. Um, we did have a bunch of questions. I felt like we addressed a lot of questions uh, today. David, I think we did pretty good. I know that there's still a lot more. What would you like to cover in like the next five minutes or so? I know, I know there's so many questions. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot and I've got all these notes here. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see, let's pick one from the audience. That would be good. Do you have one okay. there? Okay. Yeah, I mean there were there were a bunch about here. Let me see. I know I know that people are asking specifically about um, you know, metformin and berberine and all that, but we did already kind of cover that the last time. So I don't want to go over that again. I would encourage you to watch the replay though. Um we talked about fasting and you know whether or not that's suitable for you if you're someone that oh, a question that I thought was really good. There are people that are recovering from COVID and there are people that let's say they just have a cold um, or they're not feeling well, they want to know if fasting is okay. So, you know, whether or not you, you take a break from it, if you're fasting seven days a week, if you only fast three days a week or five days a week, uh, what's the best thing to do? And should you pause when, um, when you're not feeling well? 
and I know it sounds basic, but still think it's a good question. Gee, well, so definitely afterwards you want to do that. Uh, you want to have the healthiest diet possible to recover from COVID. One of the things that actually seems to drive COVID uh, is an increase in senescent cells, particularly in the lungs and also in the vascular systems. Um, and the diets that we're talking about uh, suppress the formation of senescent cells um, and potentially uh, when it comes to the molecule fazetin uh, and to some extent quercetin uh, may, and I stress may, uh, delete and kill off those senescent cells post recovery. Um, and w when I say may, there are clinical trials ongoing. So it's thought to be likely or possible to work. It certainly works in mice to extend their lifespan and kill off senescent cells. Um, but even if you don't go into fazetin and quercetin and research that, um, just by fasting, you're going to help your body recover and turn on those defenses against not just aging. It's not just about aging. It's about what happens to you over the next few weeks. Once you adopt these diets, you'll feel better already. Mm -hmm. um, and long term, you'll do better. And, you know, anecdotally, I know a number of people that have improved their, their memory and how they feel and their energy levels uh, by doing the kind of things we're recommending, which is uh, eating really well, clean, Mm -hmm. um, and giving yourself all the nutrients that you need, but not excess calories and not excess nutrients as well. Um, and just optimizing your body with some science and some, yeah. other, you know, common sense. Yeah. Yeah. And staying hydrated, you guys, it's really, really important is to stay well hydrated, especially if you're taking supplements, you know, you want to make sure that you give your body, um, the enough hydration to process. And uh, another question that came up that I thought was really good, and I'll probably be the last thing before we wrap up, is whether or not we should take breaks. You know, what happens if you're, do you take them forever? Is it okay to take them forever? Uh, do we take breaks from it? I thought that was a great question. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's see. So do, do I take breaks from exercise? Absolutely. We all should. We shouldn't be exercising five days a week. Um, and. I haven't been exercising much lately, um, but I don't worry about it. I, th I think the body needs a period of recovery. So I sometimes I don't take metformin every day. Sometimes I even skip resveratrol. Um, so I'm not that strict about it. I, I, I'm fine going a day or two. Often I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. And if I don't take a supplement one day, it's fine. And the reason that I believe that it's fine is based on science. Everything that I believe should, should be based on something. Mm -hmm. And... What we discovered, for example, was that when we gave resveratrol every day to a mouse on a high fat diet or a normal diet, um, it wasn't as effective as if we gave that molecule every other day. And the longest lived mice, we had some that lived over three years and a, a mouse typically doesn't do that. Um, it was when we gave resveratrol every other day and combined that with every other day feeding. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that the, the supplement and the food given every second day was was the best for them. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, you know, I, I don't think we need to eat constantly. We don't need to take supplements constantly either. Right. Good. Take some breaks. Um, okay, well, great. I mean, we're kind of at the top of the hour. And um, I think I just want to wrap it up so we're not rushed off um, because we're trying to squeeze in another question. But um, I thank you guys all so much for being on here today, for being so engaged, being kind with your comments. Um, and I encourage you to, if you haven't already, subscribe to David's podcast, Lifespan, um, everywhere and also on YouTube. And turn on your post notifications for both our accounts because then you'll see when we come on and we do these. And he'll also give you a reminder of when his podcast drops, which is every Wednesday. And and, uh, and also subscribe to um, our our link, the link in both our bios that gives you the replays for our chats and all the notes um, and where you can also kind of submit your questions again on the text and we can kind of keep track of those and create episodes based on what you guys need. Uh, so that's kind of it. Do you have anything that you want to add, David? Before we yeah, I do. I do. I, I want to say, you know, I've enjoyed getting to know you over the last few months and, and I know your mission is the same as mine. We do this, we speak, we research, we share information, uh, we tell stories because we want people to live better lives. It's not about the two of us living well. It's about us giving you the information to make your life better. Um, and I've loved doing these and we're going to do more. Uh, and it's towards both of our mission. And just like Andrew Huberman says, it's all about um, giving people the information that's, that's out there that most people don't have the time or the access to. 
uh, and we can share that with you in a concise form. But help us help you. Tell us, keep telling us what you need to know and we'll keep researching it and giving it back to you in hopefully not just a concise but an entertaining way. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much, you guys. Um, David's podcast drops again on Wednesday, and then we'll be back on next Monday, right? I think that's correct. So, and just keep, again, just follow along, turn on your post notifications, you'll know when we come back on. And thank you so much. Thank you for um, allowing us to serve you better. All right. Okay. Talk to you later. Thank you, David. Thanks, Rina. See you next time. Bye. Bye.